Why is this a big deal? Is because you can kill patients yourself, ruin your lives, if you don't pay attention to managing sleep during residency. On top of that, and far less importantly, it is a requirement that once a year we discuss it as a program. You're going to get asked a question on the ACGME survey asking if you've ever heard anybody mention sleep management. And about 60% of our residents say they've never heard of such a thing, OK? So I'd like to make sure people have heard of such a thing. But the big issue is what I said at the beginning. It's a reality. Residents are tired. I like this quote. I uh, picked it up the web somewhere that said, I always had a prior theory that when you look up all the old 60s research on how to brainwash someone, that was a Cold War period, et cetera, uh, you sleep deprive them. That's number two and three. Sleep deprive them. You feed them bad food and repeat things over and over again. Sounds like that covers residency. I mean, that is residency. You know, I know you get tired of old people talking about back in the day. Well, it's not easier now. It's not harder now. It's always been a problem. Um, getting sleep during residency is a challenge. So. Recognizing sleepiness in yourself and others. You've probably gone through this before. Bear with me, OK? In your mind, or with a natural pen, I'm not going to collect them. For each of these things, Adam Rainey, I want you to do this, OK? Uh, be giving your answer from 0 to 3. I picked out the person who was uh, closest to snoring in the room there, I think. So, um, uh, On 0 to 3, how likely you would be to fall asleep under these circumstances? So 0 to 3, 0, never doze. Three almost certainly does. Sitting and reading, zero to three, whatever number you have for that. Watching TV, sitting inactive in a public place. As a passenger in a car for an hour without a break. Lying down to rest in the afternoon. <laughs> sitting and talking to someone, sitting quietly after lunch, <laughs> Be honest on that one, because I, I can see that one. And uh, in a car, when stopped for a few minutes. So, Adam, what's your number on this? What's your sleep number, so to speak? Uh, five or six. Five or six. OK, so are you OK? Uh, but according to the literature, normal is in the six range, seven and eight. And if you score a nine or better, they say to seek immediate medical attention. <laughs> and. You know, all joking aside, in this you know, study where they looked at people with normal insomnia, sleep apnea, residents and narcolepsy, residents are between sleep apnea needing CPAP and narcolepsy. <laughs> I mean, this is a big problem. The problem is if you don't recognize it's a problem, you're not going to do anything about it. And what's the consequences? Now, Martin Tobin, you know, pretty brilliant and always cutting to the point. He said, what is the one role of sleep? Vic, what's the ro one role of sleep? To prevent sleepiness. <laughs> OK? That's the one role of sleep. But it is a vital, essential uh, function that affects everything in your life. I mean, all joking aside, you're, when you're sleepy, you don't perform well at work. Certainly, your mood and performance are negatively impaired. Impacts patient care and professionalism family relationships, your overall health and well-being, certainly driving safety. You're not going to learn. I mean, it affects everything. And um, this is just a big deal. Now, you know, everybody knows it's a big deal, but doctors like data. I like this study where they looked at your mean relative performance from the moment you got up through the first 25 hours. And you can see your mean relative performance dipped terribly to a, a performance level that's equivalent to being legally drunk. OK? That's a problem. In one study where they looked at residents, I know this was a randomized, but they looked at residents who self-reported five hours of sleep versus eight hours of sleep. The five hours of sleep had a four and a half times relative risk of getting into an, into an MVA. And who, whichever person got into an MVA, if you got into a motor vehicle accident and you were in the low sleep group, you had a greater chance of having a uh, serious injury. And if that doesn't matter to you, you know, Chen, you're trying to go to the gym and, you know, continue to stay in good shape. But after four days of restricted sleep, athletes will lose 20 pounds on their bench press. And I know you're probably Roger Federer level athletes or LeBron type athletes. They think they need um, lots more sleep than anybody in this room is ever really going to get. So sleep is a big deal. Drowsiness, sleepiness, and fatigue are not going to go away from residency or from being an attending physician. But we need to think about how it can be managed. 
and you're not going to do anything about it if you don't uh, recognize that it's a big problem. Um, and if it's interfering with life, you've got to do something about it. Patients have a right to expect a doctor who's awake. Way to go. I just want to repeat the story that, uh, I don't know, probably 15 years ago. I can't remember when it was that Way to Go got implemented. Do you have any idea? Maybe 10 years or something. I was having one of my annual you know, mid-year in-training exam meetings with a resident and asked whoever it was, so how's it going? And he said, oh, I'm doing fine, but did you hear about Tiffany? And I said, no, what happened to Tiffany? He goes, oh, you didn't know what happened to Tiffany? Last week, she was driving home after like an overnight shift and sticking around, fell asleep on the Eisenhower, swerved into the median. The glass like blew out into the, the car, which woke her up. She drove home, parked her car, got up in the morning, came to work, never told anybody about it. Um, the instant that this person told me about the story, I went to the GME office, and I told him that this is just not acceptable. You know, somebody died. If somebody died, how could any of us come to work? And they implemented Way to Go the next week. So, you know, it's not the be all and end all, but if you're too tired to safely drive home, please take advantage of it. It gets you back the next day as well. I always have to throw in the disclaimer, it is monitored. Every year or two, there's somebody that G the GME office identifies as having used it inappropriately, like as transportation back and forth to the airport or just for like a six week period when they, had, uh, when they were on crutches. You know, there's gotta be some other mechanism for that. Um, but sleep medicine is a big deal. So what I want you to do is think about it. Back in the old days, so Dan Dilling, um, in 2003, he did a study where they had residents wear a tachometer, like equivalent of a Fitbit now. And it was right before and right after the first set of duty hours got implemented. And the first set of duty hours, before and afterwards, the data from the, the motion detector said residents were just as active, just as uh, little sleep after the duty hours as before. And I remember him coming into my office saying, you know, you're, and, and all the residents had to complete an upward sleepiness scale as well. And he came in and said, Dr. Simpson, your residents are really, really sleepy. And they're just as sleepy after the duty hours implementation as they were before. I don't think young people outside of work necessarily spend all of their time sleeping. And it's your professional responsibility to just think about outside of work things that you do that affect your performance at work as well. Okay, I'm going to move on, but please take advantage